This podcast is brought to you by the award-winning prop firm, Fidel Crest. Trading Nut, episode 205. Because it's funny because when I went to price section, basically what he would say, what the mentor would say, is like, okay, you trade with momentum. That's fine. That was the logic behind it. With smart money, you kind of found out why the market moves of supply and demand, et cetera. Like that what you see on the charts is just algorithms. So price going from one level to another. That that was it. That's what's on the candles. With ICT, you kind of have a logical reason as to a, an actual logical reason as to why price is moving from this area to this area. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than... I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax. Learn the process. Candlestick pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up, traders? Welcome to another installment of the Trading Up Podcast. I'm your host, Cam Hawkins, and today we've got Raphael Kimmel on the show, aka Kimmel FX. Now, uh, the reason I got him on was because last week's guest, Brian Tang, recommended two traders. One of them was Alisa Mores, who has been on the show. Fantastic interview. People loved it. Single mum to seven figure trader. Go and check it out. The other person he recommended was Kimmel FX. So that's why I've got him on. So it is another fantastic interview you're about to hear, and you're going to find out um, how he managed to find the perfect mentorship and what was that mentorship that gave him the perfect start to being a trader. Also, why he eventually took ICT's free mentorship on the YouTube channels over there and uh, how he became a funded trader. So that's all coming up in this week's show. Now, we're heading into the Christmas period here and next week I've got a bit of a special kind of episode with one of my Robot Builder Club clients. Now, why have I got him on? It's because in two years, this guy's done some amazing stuff. He's managed to get himself uh, into a fund with the algos that he's created. Yes, the number of algos he's created that are churning out profits every day. Uh, These algos are now working for this fund. So it's an amazing story. You're going to hear that next week. And if if this sort of thing resonates with you, if you're thinking, okay, look, maybe I want to start trying to build some robots, then go and check out the Robot Builders Club. It's over there on tradingnut.com. Whilst you're clicking around over there, go and check it out. There is a free training you can take as well and a coupon you can grab if you hit me up in the chat if you're looking to take on the challenge of building trading robots without doing any coding as well all right folks now before we get on the show we're going to hear from my sponsor who i've just found out are now doing 24 hour funding so you can get yourself funded from the beginning of the day to the end of the day pass all their challenges and end up as a funded trader so folks worthwhile checking them out let's hear from them now Fidel Crest is an award-winning prop firm that funds traders with up to $2 million and offers generous profit splits up to 90%. So what sets Fidel Crest apart? Well, it's their verification stage payouts of up to 30 k in as little as 15 days. So you can receive your first payout prior to becoming a fully funded trader. Just complete the challenge phase and verification stage without violating any rules to receive your first payout. And be sure to use promo code TRADINGNUT, all one word, to get 10% off your next challenge. Click the link in the description below or the card above to find find out more. All right, folks, here we are on Trading Up. We've got Kimmel FX in the house. Welcome to the show, Kimmel. Thank you for bringing me on. Hey, look, so um, where are you based, first of all? And then we're going to dive into the uh, whole trading journey to get you to where you are today. Yeah, so I live currently in Portugal, uh, right, Europe, yeah. Portugal, yeah. Lovely, yeah. lovely. But I actually spent about three weeks there myself when I was traveling around Europe, did a job on the Algarve. Uh, handing out flyers and okay. selling those trips to the grottos. So um, loved yeah. Portugal, absolutely loved it. Now, um, how did you get into trading? And let's hear your journey to today. What what was it like? Yeah, so basically I started trading almost like four years ago. Uh, it was in October of four years ago. And <clears throat> I started with signals. Uh, a friend of mine told me, dude, there's this one guy that I trust completely on Instagram. And I was like, okay, he trusts him. It was it was a friend of mine back then. And I was like, okay, let me give this a shot. 
messaged him. He was it was a standard signal provider, so he just gave me a standard message of okay, you have to deposit this with through this link because that's the only way that it works. Deposited 400 pounds. First trade uh, that I set on MT4. It was beautiful. Why? Because I just set some random numbers on an app, and all of a sudden I was making like 10 pounds, and by the, back then i was a student i was 18 years old and i was making seven pounds an hour and so i was like wait i can't just follow i can simply follow what this person is telling me and make money without doing anything and it's funny because i think it was like two days ago i remembered the story of me coming back to portugal and that christmas and and telling my friends about it and one of them was like super stoked and I was like, dude, yeah, I think I'll have a Tesla in like two years time. I think I'll have enough money to buy a Tesla in two years time. And now I look back and I'm like, oh my God. But I don't regret any of it. Why? Because at least this guy that made me lose 800 pounds, at least presented me to the opportunity of trading. Mm. I never heard of it before. I never knew chart work, patterns, etc. And in a... In a way of making my money back, I started looking into what this forex thing was, what what everything that they will that they were presenting was, and I came about my first community. I joined, uh, I joined February of two thousand and eighteen, I believe. Yeah, maybe two thousand and nineteen, and it was amazing. It it was I couldn't have asked for a better community to join, because they were so focused on the process of trading. They were like, okay, you need to set goals. You need to forecast every single day. You need to backtest every single day. You need to review every single day. Focus on your trades. Focus on your process. Don't think about prop firms. Like the prop firms weren't even a thing back then. Mm. All these things just made me f- through my first year of trading be so focused on the process that I learned the best foundation I could ask for in trading. That was I couldn't ask for anything better. Like looking back, there's no, there's no, I don't know. Oh, there, there might that, be something is, better that, out that, there. That sounds like a pretty good start, <laughs> like to get you away from all yeah. the other stuff. Before you even dove into like strategies and, you know, hopping from those those things, uh, that's fantastic. Are you able to say what the yeah. community was or are you happy to say what it is? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. It was Falcon Falcon Trading Guidance. That, oh, that okay. was my first community. Okay. Okay. And again, I've, I'm internally grateful for them because it was it was a life changer because I was 18. I was very impressionable when I was 18. So anything people would tell me to do, I would pro- I would have probably done it. Yeah. So if my first mentor instead of saying focus on the process and set goals, he he, w- he would be like, "Okay, focus on making money and going out to the clubs to show everyone that you have money." I would probably do the same. Yeah. And my value <laughs> system would com- would be completely different. Because when we are when we are young, that's when that's when people can put this new impressions on us, and it lead and it sticks with us for the rest of our lives. So that's why I couldn't have asked for anything better. Then uh, COVID started, and I wasn't seeing the same results. Like I was, I I was starting to see consistency. I I, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. But every, everyone started joining another community of a mentor that had been before in, in my first community, and he created the new one. And I got that shiny object syndrome. I was like, damn, they, they are making a lot of percentage. That was the first time that I was also presented with the opportunity of trying to trade for prop firms. They were the first people to tell me like, hey, you can achieve 10% in one month. And they will give you a 100k account, and that completely exploded my mind. I was like, "What? This is such a big opportunity!" Because before I was always focused on, okay, get consistent first, and then go to private investors. That's that was the road that I was that I was taking. And this new community took me through the prop firm to, uh, through the prop firm process, and and so on. I got some I got some prop firm accounts. Also, blew some blew some of them and yeah i stick with that community for around one year uh got consistent with it but then again new trend smart money and i was like 
fuck, these guys are being so precise in the market. Like they are just basically being snipers in the market. They they are looking at the market from such a beautiful way where you're just so precise. And I was like, I want to try that. I tried it, didn't like it, went back to my to my second community, was still consistent there. Can I, can I ask what that first sort of, then, uh, that first style of trading was before smart money? Uh, it was so I started with structure, which was Falcon, and then it was just straight up price action. So one time frame, uh, two setups, and just trading that and in four pairs. That's what uh, that's what I was trading, right? And that's where I got my first consistency. Then went to smart money, didn't like it, went back to price action, and well stayed stayed consistent but then again a lot of people started changing the the strategy wasn't seeing many results and it's funny because it was also always q4 that didn't have the best results and that's when people started changing every time the strategy would have less results you would see everyone being like the strategy is trash i want to change and i fell into that trap too and i went to smart money but for the second time i actually enjoyed it so I enjoyed it, found consistency with it, or not consistency, more like fluke months, basically, and got some prop firm accounts, got some consistency through the prop firms too. And then basically two months ago, found out about ICT, started studying it too. And now my focus was just to increase my strike rate, maybe reduce the risk to reward in order to increase the strike rate because I understood that I like to be in trades, but I also like being right more than I like being wrong. And so I started playing with those with those things to form my own strategy. So it was four years in the making of going through three different styles and now sticking to something that I really, really enjoy. And so the so you it sounds like you've you learned smart money before so you only met uh, ICT two months ago. Uh, and started yeah. learning his stuff. And in what in what capacity is that? Just through the the free stuff he's put on the YouTube, or through other means? Yeah, just the just the free stuff. I watched the twenty twenty two mentorship. Uh, I also watched the market maker series, and I haven't watched the core content, neither the forex series. The, those are the two ones that, that I still want to watch. And from the your understanding of smart money before that, and then after watching uh, well, what you've watched. Have you sort of picked up uh, exponential growth of knowledge or is it sort of like just uh, added a little bit to what you're doing? I think it added a little bit to to what I was doing. It was not exponential. It just gave me a new perspective on the market. Because it's funny because when I went to price section, basically what he would say, what the mentor would say is like, okay, you trade with momentum. That's fine. That was the logic behind it. With smart money, you kind of found out why the market moves of supply and demand, et cetera, like that what you see on the charts is just algorithms. So price going from one level to another. That that was it. That's what's on the candles. With ICT, you kind of have a logical reason as to a, an actual logical reason as to why price is moving from this area to this area. And that's what I picked up on. And the style of entries also changed. I wanted entries less precise, less precise in price, so bigger stop losses, but more precise in delivery. Okay, so you so you wanted bigger stop losses, but is it high, is it, was it a higher win rate that came with that? Is that what you sort of alluded yeah. to? Okay. Yeah, right. So h- higher win rate and higher frequency of trades because what happens with smart money, with the communities that I personally know, is that they try to be very precise with like two, three, maybe five pip stops, while now my average is maybe like between 10 and 15. When the market is less volatile, maybe seven, but it's like 10, 15. Okay, okay. So so uh, going back to your journey, like in, in terms of that sort of progression through ups and downs, I mean, what we, can you talk us through one of those sort of d- down moments where you were just like, I th- I, you know, this just isn't working. Was there anything like that? Yeah, definitely. I think the biggest downs were probably when I was changing strategies because you're you're kind of sacrificing something that is working and you know in order to look for something better. 
And you would always fall into that cycle of, okay, now I have to put a lot of work in for me to get the results that others are getting. And so every time that would happen, that would be lows of my journey. And then probably like the first time or second that I blew a funded account, that's when I was like, what is going on? Because what would always happen is that I would get the funded account and directly after I would get into drawdown and not get out of the drawdown. And so I was like, what is going on? And so I understood that the problem was psychological, but the biggest lows definitely came from from that perception of there's something in my mind that is blocking me from achieving the success. So those were those were the biggest downsides, maybe through losing streaks. Yeah. And, and had you sort of overcome the sort of psychological uh, things that were holding you back? So I started... I started talking and creating a bigger relationship with Pat Belluni. You all already had him on the channel uh, too. Yes, yeah. And it it was it was very good because he opened my eyes. So he's basically a trading performance coach for people that don't know. He's a trading performance coach and he would he would put things from a logical perspective in my mind. He was the first person to teach me about the logic of importance. So why do you why are you putting so much emphasis on being funded? You don't, it, it, nothing changes. You, you simply have to keep sticking to the plan. You just, you are just putting the funded on the pedestal. And mm. since I started understanding that being funded has positives and negatives, that's when everything started clicking. And I started balancing things out much, much more. So investing in my psychology was definitely the best thing and creating a relationship with people that would hold me accountable. Those were definitely the best things. And did you do Pat's boot camp, or did you do personal one-on-one kind of stuff with him? What was your approach there? So, I did personal one-on uh, one-on-ones with with Pat. Well, not when we were making videos together. Then we would talk a little bit after and okay. before. Yeah. Uh, some some Instagram message, uh, some Instagram messages, and I'm going to do his boot camp in the first quarter of 2023. Yeah, guys, do go and check out the interview I did with him as well. It's pretty good on the channel there, so well worth checking out. And it does remind me of what he was talking about about the pedestal, and you know, I, I yeah. even forgot about that myself. Um, okay, that's fantastic. So, so what did your stats look like going into like? What, what, what are we uh, say like second quarter of or late last three months? What did they look like? Do you want to sort of walk us through things like win rate, risk to rewards, uh, number of trades per week, that kind of thing? Yeah. So through this last quarter, I'm going to I'm yeah I'm going to use this last quarter. I started with an average strike rate of maybe like thirty percent, thirty percent with an average risk to war, risk to reward of maybe maybe one to six, one to seven. But the thing is, is that it wasn't super profitable because I was missing a lot of winning trades. Mm. So that's when I started diving more into the ICT stuff and increasing my strike rate. Reduced, I reduced the uh, the risk to reward to an average of one to three, one to two, one to three, one to four. But I also increased my strike rate all the way up to like 60, 60, 65%. So that's what I've mm. been trying to achieve with an average tr- number of trades of five per week there are days where you have well yeah you asked average so, so yeah an average yeah. five trades per week that's interesting uh, i was actually on a call with somebody else another trader and i can't remember who it was but i'm i was trying to get to this point of and i think they had a 30 percent strike rate of uh how do you, what happens when you miss the trade ah oh, i know i know why they why it wasn't an issue for them because they were hedging uh, but so you for you it is an issue because yeah if you miss say two winners then you've got a chance of getting nine well the rest of them are going to be losers right so the so you now at a ten percent strike rate in reality because yeah yeah so so that's so okay that because I, I was thinking that just the other day I was like these low win rate strategies if you miss these trades uh, you're gonna struggle at at points. Yeah. Other points, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, okay. So you got. So that's why you, you managed to bring the the strike rate up, and it's an ease off on the on the risk to reward. So so what's your sort of overall view on you know these uh, traders that are able to take you know twenty to ones and all these sort of humongous 
kind of risk to reward trades. Do you think it is sustainable and with a high win rate as well, with everything you know around smart money concepts and and uh, and how the market works? So uh, are you asking if it's possible to have a high strike rate with a high risk, risk to reward? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. With a high risk to reward. Do you think that's that's possible? Is that a nirvana that you're trying to achieve? I don't, I don't I don't know that's that's the answer that I can give because in my mind I don't think it's logically possible for someone to achieve 1 to 20 with a 70% strike rate because then there would be millionaires trillion, trillionaires really quickly mm. if you if you put that on the compound calculator then we're getting crazy returns in a matter mm. of a decade so I, since I have never seen that being done before, I don't believe that it's possible. Now, the people that – and that's when we have to use our own discretion when we are on social media and maybe seeing those people that are posting those 1 to 20s and really ask ourselves, what is behind it? Is is there any lying behind it? Is there any – was it a micro lot? Whatever, like – yeah. People have to be very careful careful with that. But if you're asking me if it's sustainable to have a high strike rate, then I would say yes. Uh, I I have I personally have friends that have wait having a high risk to reward, then I would say yes because I personally have friends that have maybe a 30% strike rate but ha- but average out a 1 to 5 and they are extremely consistent mm. because in their minds they don't miss the winning trades. So you need to look at yourself and be like, okay, would I be able to handle five losing trades that all would have fit the plan and still take the sixth that would give me the one to 10? Mm. Yes or no? I personally, I, I noticed that I was not able to do that. I Because we have that confirmation bias and what would happen is I would take a loss and I would be like, oh, this is why it's not in the plan because of this, 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 this resulted in a loss. Instead of thinking, okay, this was probabilities. Let's move on to the next one. And now I'm much more able to do that. So took a loss. That's fine. Every, everything was checked. Okay, that's fine. I move on and I take the next one. So having a, I think the market balances out. To answer your question, I think the market balances out. It's a trifecta of mm-hmm. Strike rate, frequency of trades, and risk to reward. The higher your risk to reward, the lower your strike rate. And and if you have a high risk to reward and a high strike rate, you have less frequency of trades. Maybe you're taking like one per month because you're waiting for that perfect trade. But if you have a high strike rate and high frequency of trades, you probably have a lower risk to reward because you're taking mm. those scalps or, yeah. or or day trades that are consistent but they are not going to give you big risk rewards because the market is efficient. Yeah. The market needs to be efficient. It can't just plummet to one side. It, it need, That trifecta is always respected in my mind. Mm. And I think that that's a really interesting point because I was actually going to ask you about frequency of trades and around the risk to reward and strike rate. And I think that's the th- key thing that people don't tend to talk about is the frequency of trades in comparison to those two things. So it's great to hear that. And it's the first time I've heard it on the show where you've almost like, you know, you've got that sliding scale. Someone could almost put it in a chart and put it up on like an Instagram post of those three things and how they work together. It's, it's quite fascinating. Um, so so what, ma- uh, what markets are you trading at the moment? So I only trade Forex and I only trade the Euro dollar. I like to focus on just one pair and do you do any sort of fundamental analysis around what you're uh, about around entering the trades no fundamental analysis mostly technical i look to see if there are any high impact news coming but i don't actively trade them i do that mostly with stocks really but stocks i only have like an investment portfolio that's a whole different thing uh with trading, day trading, I only look at technical analysis. Okay. And what does your typical trading day look like? Wake up at 6, uh, 6.30 a.m. Uh, I forecast. So this is all London time. Uh, I forecast and my goal is that at 7 a.m. I'm at the charts and I'm ready 
with my forecast done because at 7 a.m. London, Frankfurt opens and at 8 a.m. London opens. So you get that first injection injection of volatility at 7 a.m. So I want to be ready by then. Then I basically am at the charts and back testing, reviewing some trades, reading all that between 7 and midday. That's that's basically that's the time that I'm at the charts. Go do my lunch at 2 p.m. back at the charts. I keep looking at the charts, but like between 1 and maybe 3, I'm still at the charts, p.m. And then afterwards, that's when I review the day. That's when I read. That's when I go to the gym. So, so yeah. So that's, in terms of that's your... That's my typical trading day, really. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's, and so in terms of like your reviewing the... So when you're entering the trades at the start of the day, I mean, when it, well, actually, when are you typically entering the trades? And are you doing it at market or are you placing limit orders or stop orders? Uh, pl- placing limit orders, yeah. That's, that- that's by the way, that's, that's one thing that I really noticed that my previous SMC strategy, it required me to enter on market orders. And so my mind was constantly like, Okay, let me try to get a better entry. Let me try to get a better entry because because I was using the five seconds. So sometimes it would go one tick up that would completely change my risk to reward because I was using like 1.5 two pip stops. Mm-hmm. And if the price would start going, I would get super emotional. I wouldn't hit market. So limit orders are the way to go for me, definitely, because I don't hesitate. It's like the trade is there. Mm-hmm. And and you'll set those at one particular point in the day, or do you set them across the whole day? I, tr- I actively trade between seven and three p.m. So that's the when the time window that I set trades. I'm still trying to understand if I'm trying to look at my data to understand if I'm going to set trades between ten ten a.m. and twelve p.m. Because that's what uh, ICT says, don't set trades here because no algorithms are working or uh, there's no volatility, whatever mm. it is. I I haven't figured out in my data if that's something that I want to implement. Mm. I mean, I've looked at that uh, in particular on like algo stuff and there's definitely a, a, there's definitely the spike and then the drop and then the spike again when New York opens in terms of, I suppose yeah. if we look at, if you call it volatility, and you know you can see that it does slow down between those hours uh if that helps now um okay so you're placing these limit orders and and what have you got something that and the thing with limit orders i suppose is when do you cancel them have you got rules in place that tells you okay well i'll now cancel these limit orders or is that something you do at the end of the day if they didn't get triggered new day we start again yeah, so if price starts moving in the direction that I forecasted without tapping me in, there comes a point where my trade idea is now not valid anymore. And I have rules for that. So if we've created new structure, but the direction is still there, I might have a new trade set up. So that's when I delete one order and set another one. Or if price just invalidates completely, or for example, yesterday that it was a picture perfect delivery so uh, but there was no entry but price reached my potential first target so i was like okay i'll just delete the order so sometimes that's what that's what price does and the bane of limit orders uh is they get so close to being filled and don't get filled what what do you, uh, yeah. i suppose first of all how did you sort of cope with that initially because i know it is one of these things that just can screw the head uh, and then what do you do now when that happens and price shoots off in your direction. At what point do you sort of give up on that that level? Yeah, so that, that's a good question because yesterday was the perfect scenario for that because I was waiting the whole day for a particular trade for price to sweep a certain area and give me the entry. Price did exactly that, but it didn't give me the, the entry. And it didn't give me the entry by maybe two pips of a candle closing or like two seconds. And I saw price going and I was like, fuck, come on, just come back to my entry. But I just started writing down, like I have my, I have my notebook here. Like this is, this is from yesterday. I basically wrote down what I was, what I was feeling, like trying to inject some, inject some logic to it. And I was like, 
there's no there's no need to keep the trade on. Why? Because or or there's no need to look for new trades. Why? Because the setup is not there. Mm. And if you're trying to force it, you basically have the FOMO that there will be no other trades in the market in the future. So once you understand that that's where it's coming from, you can start understanding that, okay, I don't need to set this straight. I don't need price to pull back. Is it unfortunate? Yes, but like you take the punch and you move on because eventually you've seen this through your data that eventually price will give you the entry and it will give you the profitability long term. Yeah, so, and so is that your journal there in terms of what how you sort of get those feelings and emotions out of your head and onto something else that's not you? Yeah, and do you I, do th- I do I did sorry and ahead. you do that every day you're like when you're or sorry when when do you actually use that journal yeah so i have it right in front of me so i can just grab the pen and start writing if needed i also do something else which is at the charts when the price is playing out i start commenting like i literally grab the call out tool on trading view and i start writing everything i'm feeling ah. in that particular trade because then at the end of the day, when I'm reviewing my psychology, when I'm reviewing you, when I'm reviewing why I didn't enter an X Y Z trade, I can be like, okay, that's how I was feeling at the moment. So, so yeah, that's uh, yesterday. I I wrote quite a bit. So, and do you, do you take a screenshot of that chart that you've written on and save that so you can go back and review it at some point in the future? Yeah, so I have three daily processes that are key. Morning forecast, daily recap, and daily markup. So the daily recap, so the morning forecast is straightforward. The daily recap is basically a screenshot of any trade that I've taken or how price delivered it. And the markup is the perfect trading plan would have taken these trades. And I take screenshots for all of those, review the day, review my psychology, and then at the end of every week, I go through all of those screenshots again. Oh, cool. So that's how, I, that's how I use it, yeah. And, uh, and when you say the perfect trading plan would have taken these trades, how often are you on the money with like, getting the match up of, like, let's say, 100% of you getting the perfect trading plan? When I was trading smart money, it was much less than now. Now, uh, this last two weeks, I've been bang on. Uh, there's been there, there's been some times where I may be like seventy percent, but it's it's getting better and better because I've gotten way less discretion in my plan, where it's much more black and white. Again, I I, I think discretion is a big taboo in trading, but I think it's still important. But having a rule based plan where you because the thing is, we're co- we're constantly using our bias. And for example, this morning, beautiful trade, possible long, and I didn't take it. And I was like, hmm, this trade worked out. So I wrote down on the charts, what's the logic behind this trade working out? And do I have any examples of the trade of this uh, setup very, very much the same, not playing out? So that's that's uh, a key a key thing to have to have that knowledge that you are going to be biased when you miss a trade and it results in a loss you're much less probable of setting that trade in your journal than if you miss a trade and you take a win and you would have taken a win because you will find reasons as to why that win was in your plan and you will find reasons as to why that loss was not in your plan mm. so we need to be careful with that bias yeah, yeah, that's yeah, so true, so true. Now, um, I'm going to sort of step back into into you for a bit here. Uh, so you're a young guy, you're, you're at home every day doing this. Uh, you went through, you, you said you did university, right? Uh, I did one one year. One year. So so oh, nice. all, your, all your friends and staff are out there, you know, doing these day jobs and that. You're not. Now, how did you find that from like a sort of, mentality point of view like uh how do you sort of keep yourself um accountable and all this sort of stuff i mean what what's the sort of key drivers here for you to to be able to do this and not like have to i mean when i look back at my my life i go well i was like you know i did the nine to five for many many years and so I had a good reason to to like go okay, i actually enjoy no i know what i'm missing now so 
I can enjoy the fact that I'm missing that. Whereas you didn't, haven't done the big nine to five. So what's the sort of key driver here and the thinking behind what you're doing? Because it sort of really sort of speaks to you as an individual. Yeah. So I actually worked from when I was 15 until I was 21. Now, of course, I'm not, it, it's not comparable with someone that maybe worked for 20 years. Like I'm definitely in, I'm very grateful for the position that I'm in where I didn't have to work on a nine to five for that long. Now, my driver was always, was always like, I want financial freedom and I want freedom of time but freedom of time first. And I want to do something that I really enjoy. And then trading came into the game. Like since I remember that when I went to the UK, I didn't know because I went to study in the UK. uh, I didn't know that I was going to trade, but I knew I was going to be an entrepreneur of some sorts. People would always ask me, so what do you want to do? Oh, I want to start a business. What business? I don't know, but I'll start a business because I always knew I wanted to work for myself. Now, this sounds super cliche. It's true. Like, oh, who doesn't want freedom of time, whatever. Yeah, but at the same time, how many people take the risks for that possibility to to come true? So I've always been someone that takes those risks and doesn't mind the possibility of failure. Obviously doesn't enjoy it, but doesn't mind the possibility of failure. So my driver was was always being able to make money from wherever I want, whenever I want, and trading gave me that possibility. Mm-hmm. That's why I stick stick to it for so long. And on and on that front, I mean, have you been able to sustain your sort of lifestyle through the trading income, solely the trading income? Uh, I don't know if you've got any other source of income, but I mean, solely through that, have you been able to sort of sustain? what you would consider a, an adequate or, a, or a, I suppose, a more extravagant lifestyle than if you were taking a day job? Uh, no, but that can, that, well, yes and no, because I, I'm saying yes, uh, because the lifestyle here in Portugal is not expensive at all. Yeah. For, for, a lo- for a long time, I still lived with my parents. I was very, very happy with that. No, not not happy. I was very grateful for that possibility. Very lucky uh, to have that possibility. But no, because you said extravagant. And when when we're talking about extravagant, I would have in my mind that we were maybe talking like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 per month. And I'm still on that journey of getting to those figures. So not yet. But I can indeed sustain myself with tro- with trading with the trading income, because prop firms just make it easy. Mm, yeah, and look, I mean, you it, can have a fluke month. Sorry, you can have a fluke month, and that will pay for the bills. But but yeah, I, I, but I know what consistency you're talking about. Yeah, and and it is look, it is the long game really with with trading as people who listen to the show regularly will know um and with that comes you know as soon as you get that consistency the, the doors open up all over the place now uh other thing i want to ask is around your sort of what made you different in the beginning so you obviously had that entrepreneurial mindset which we know you you had uh, you knew that was going to happen but what do you think made you different from a trading point of view to be able to get to the point now where you are like, you know, you can regularly pass and withdraw from a funding challenge. What's the key element here that you see that you're doing that other people haven't done? I know that that group at the start got the process stuff embedded, but even with that, some people might not even be able to do that. What's the, what do you think makes you a bit different from everyone? I would say that the main difference there actually comes from something else, which is, having the safety net before. So the reason I don't need to pass prop firms, that's why, that's one of the reasons that I do, is because I've removed the need to do it. And so since I'm not forcing it, it's easier for that to happen because when you're forcing it, that's when you feel more FOMO, that's when you feel fe- fe- feel more fear of losing the challenge because then you won't have any more money. You spent your last couple hundred dollars on, on a challenge. And once, since I was in the UK, I was working 10 hours per day on average, just in order to have a safety net to come back to Portugal. 
building other sources of sources of, of income while growing my my trading skill and then using then using everything all that safety net that I've built up from the UK to buy those challenges and then it it was a snowball effect that made me not have to pass challenges and that's the biggest thing and that's when people that's why going full time trading can be a little bit uh, can be a little bit misleading because you are creating that expectation of i have to withdraw consistently because else i won't pay the bills mm. i need more money because else i can buy more challenges how am i going to have more assets under management how am i going to grow my trading account all these things i was doing while i was working so so that was one of one of the things that really helped yeah i think i mean like i think everyone in the you know the perfect world is thinking like okay right let's just get some you know i'm going to make all my money through trading and i'm i'm going to be the best trader ever but the reality is why would you put that pressure on yourself and i think any kind of uh, i suppose business or business owner have you know they diversify their clients at least so they don't have one client that they're relying on and they just service that one client they've got many clients and they know that if one of the clients disappears they've got other clients to keep the business going so it's it's that kind of kind of thinking whereas i think a lot of people that come into it just are black and white and they go no nah, you're either trading for a living or or you're not yeah um and and there's no in between but it's that's not reality and it's a bit silly if that's the way you look at it now diving into a price chart what about uh what three things would you recommend somebody who maybe even doesn't know about smart money concepts um and how that works educate themselves on when looking at a chart so basically the foundations of trading first and understanding why price moves. I think underst- like looking visually at the chart, it's, it's, the way, it's the way to go first. But actually understanding the logic behind it is important. So having a good foundation of simply, if, we, if I'm talking to a beginner, I'm going to say, learn a, a good foundation, learn those basic things of what a candlestick is, what all, all, all these things are. But to a more advanced trader, I would say think about what makes the market move and where this price move to. And this is where you then implement algorithms and you probably implement liquidity. And that's those are the two main factors that I think about when I'm doing my analysis is where's liquidity at? Where are the market magnets? That those are the two things that I'm looking for. Okay. And- that's what makes price move. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you might, people might need to go and re- research some of that. Uh, now, if uh, if you you've got, talked about mindset quite a bit, you've got some good tips and techniques. If you had to sort of like share one real good hack with the people listening or watching, what would that be? Mindset hack, technical hack, or uh, mindset hack? Sorry, mindset hack. The bi- the biggest mindset hack would be reduce. Reduce the importance of whatever you are doing. If you really, really want to become a trader, it's it's good if you are not putting your life on it. So if you are doing prop firms because you have to do prop firms, this goes back to what we just talked about. Mm. If you are put if you are putting your neck out there for prop firms, there's going to be much more pressure. And because of pressure, there will be much more fear. There will be much more FOMO. There will be much more limiting beliefs. So if you can do your best to reduce that importance, and if that comes from building a safety net first, building the stats behind it, starting with something smaller because everyone wants to go for that six-figure funded account instead of starting maybe with a 20K, 50K, 10K, 5K, whatever. It's a starting, it's a stepping stone. People want to go from zero to 100K like this, like, Mm -hmm. That doesn't that that's not fathomable. Like you can't trade for three months, expect to quit your job because you got a funded account. That's not sustainable. Yeah. Like no business works like that. Yeah. So why would trading be any different? Yeah. So it gets back to that Pat Bailey thing around that that the importance keeping that and and what what thing did you do to try and this uh, I suppose this what am I trying to say here like. Uh, Knock, knock the uh, the trading prop firm kind of thing uh, down a peg or two. What were the th- what were the things in your head or your, the actions you took to to make that happen? 
I understood the negatives of the person I was becoming when I was funded. I noticed, like, I noticed that I started to become a little bit more egotistical. I started to not care that much about money anymore. So if you don't care about money, it doesn't care about you too. So it's going to, to start going away a little bit quicker. So I understood, uh, just as Pat says, that there are positives and negatives with prop firms. And those negatives come from what you do after. Like maybe you start neglecting your friends a little bit more. Maybe you start becoming like those crypto people that on Twitter say, have fun being poor. Like, the fuck is that, man? Like, who are you to 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 talk someone down like that? I, I, By the way, I've never talked to someone down like that of have fun being poor. Like, and I would, I would never do. It's just that I noticed that my, that my personality was becoming a little bit worse because of my ego. So yeah. by under, by understanding that I noticed, okay, so having money and having prop firms is not all good. And I did the exercise that, but that Pat shows, says to do of what are the negatives that you see of having a funded account, of being profitable, of having a million dollars. Ask yourself, like the viewers sh- should ask themselves, what what would be the negatives of you right now having a million dollars? I would right now come up to you, give you a million dollars. There, It would not be all positive. Mm. What are the negatives? And then you can balance things out and you won't, become egotistical or whatever it is that you would feel. So that definitely, definitely helped because not, not only did it help with my prop firms, but also with my life because I became more logical. And did you write down like a list of these things? Was that how you sort of, uh, I suppose, brought it out of you? Yeah. yeah. So Pat actually has a, a exercise that he sent me. So, ah, okay. That's okay. what I did. All right. Um, guys, go and check out that interview with Pat for, for links and stuff. Now, if there was one thing you'd recommend any retail tra- trader spend the next month mastering, what would it be? Depends on the level of the trader. So if we're talking about a retail trader that has just entered, then foundations of trading, an intermediate trader, then liquidity, an advanced trader, psychology. Cool. Be, there, the, there's one thing that I that I would like to say is that I think now people are putting too much emphasis on the psychology, not understanding that you can have the best psychology, but if you don't have a profitable plan, that the psychology is not going to do much. Yeah. So at least get the profit, not 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 the profitability, but uh, the prospect of profitability first, and then go for the mindset. Mm. You you can't you can't trade for two months and be like oh my, everything that's wrong with me is psychology no it's technical first and then the psychology very well put now we're going to jump into a quick fire round before we wrap up here so the first question is how long did it take you to go from newbie to consistently profitable three three and a half years what's your favorite entry setup. Grab of liquidity, market displacement, fair value gap, entry. And what strategies do you use to exit or manage trades? I I exit either at equilibrium of the leg or the next pocket of liquidity. Uh, do you have a recommended trading book or resource? I would say the same as maybe 90% of people that come here with just trading in the zone. But again, it's not going to make wonders. So yeah, trading in the zone and maybe Pat's YouTube channel. Uh, what, and uh, my channel. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and <yeah>. your channel. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's channel. Um, YouTube. Uh, <laughs> what's your preferred broker and trading platform? I personally trade with Blueberry Markets and then prop firms, FTMO, my Forex funds. <laughs> Hey folks, ever wonder what broker I use? Well, I use Hanko Trade. It was a no-brainer because I was looking for a broker with good trading conditions and one that wouldn't restrict my leverage. Now, by joining Hanko Trade, I've also cut down my trading costs significantly with their super low commission of just $1 per 100k. You can learn more at hankotrade.com or just click the link I've put in the description. Do you want to walk us through your worst ever trade? Uh, Yeah, I can walk you through it. 
I I would need to find it, but oh, just uh, just describe it, it. Just sorry, just describe the, the your oh, worst ever okay. trade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. My my worst ever trades come from when I'm expecting something from the market, it doesn't deliver, and I enter in a market order because I'm like, yeah, it's still going in this in this direction, and it completely retraces. It happens. It happened to me. It wasn't not even long ago after CPI where the market plummeted. CPI was terrible. I think was it uh, CHF? I think, was it Swiss Swiss franc? It, no, no, it was the it was on the S and P. Uh, the market dropped maybe eighty dollars, uh, eight, and it was fundamentally horrible. Like CPI was, I think inflation was eight point six percent. I think I entered short after the move down, and then the market just completely re- reversed from there, and I then I took the loss. It was an emotional loss. That's why it was it was bad. And final question, if there was one thing you could leave our listeners with, what would it be? One piece of advice. Comparison is the thief of all joy. This is also cliche, but it's really, really true. Yeah. If if you are if you are currently looking at me and you're like, okay, it took him three and a half years to become profitable. I became profitable in one. Huh. I'm I'm a king. I'm a G. Well, what if I would right now tell you that I was profitable in half a year? How would you feel? Exactly. Like, we can't really compare ourselves to trading not to me, to whoever it is, because everyone's on their own journey. So if you are comparing yourself to others, there's always, don't only compare yourself to people that are worse off than you, because you will boost your ego like that. But if you compare yourself to people that are better off than you, that will completely undermine your ego. So compare yourself to the peop- to the person that you were yesterday. How much better of a trader are you than one week ago, one month ago, six months ago? Are you better? Yes or no? That's the best question that you can ask yourself. And not, fuck, I made 5%, but trading not did 20%. Oh my God, I'm so terrible. No, you did 5%. Like, that's not bad. How good did you stick to your process? That's the main question. Great piece of advice to end the show on. Love it. Um, before we wrap up, what's the best way for the traders to get hold of you? So my YouTube channel is Kimmel Trading. Uh, you all, I also have Twitter, Instagram. I don't really use Instagram, but Instagram is Rafael Kimmel. Uh, Twitter is Kimmel Trading too. So, so Kimmel Trading, just at Kimmel Trading. Yeah, that's all. Well, look, a big thank you to Raphael Kimmel uh, for sharing with us today. Everything we've discussed here and with all those links are going to be in the show notes to find them. Probably search for uh, Raphael Kimmel FX in the search box on tradingnut.com. Until next time, I wish all my listeners trading happiness and success. <laughs> All right, folks, there you have it. Interview done and dusted with Kimmel FX. Now, if you do want to find out how he approaches a price chart, then check out the video we shot after this where he breaks down everything in detail. So great education for you. There is a link below this video or in the podcast description. Click on it. It'll take you to Kimmel's page. The video will be on that page there. Whilst you're clicking around tradingnut.com, and if you're interested in building trading robots, then have a look at my Robot Builders Club free training. First, you get a bot there as well if you want to play with that. And also, uh, there is that coupon code you can hit me up for in the chat. All right, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.